Afternoon, everyone. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Tom Bonner from Hewlett Packard Enterprise. He's going to talk about hacking like a nation state. This sounds good. Tom, over to you. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Good to see you all here. So yeah, my name's Tom Bonner. I'm security consultant with HPE's Digital Investigation Services team. And yeah, I have the rather cool job of dissecting APT uh, campaigns primarily run by nation states. So uh, what we're going to look at today, if this goes next, is some of the tactics, techniques, and procedures that we've seen various nation state threat actors employ over the last year. Um, so we're going to look a bit at some web shells, uh, how they can be operated, some RAT C2, so remote access Trojan command and control. Um, we'll look a little bit at a piece of malware called PlugX. Uh, sticky keys, which you probably know quite a bit about already. Uh, some WMI persistence and a little bit on Dropbox. So web shells. Certainly becoming a lot more prevalent. Um, is that better? Excellent. Um, web shells certainly become a lot more prevalent over the last year. Um, we're seeing these with most campaigns these days. Uh, generally deployed after the initial compromise, we will see these dropped onto a web server. Um, it's a very powerful persistence mechanism. Um, you, know, you can run all sorts of commands through these. You can tunnel data back. Um, and you know, it can be quite hard to spot, actually. Um, yeah, several of the, the instances where we've seen this, you look in the, the log files, there's little information. You look on the network. Certainly, if it's HTTPS protected, you're not really going to see it that well. Um, yeah, so we'll look a bit at a specific web server called Chopper. Uh, it's very trivial to implement. Uh, it takes only a few bytes client side to compromise a machine. Uh, it's platform independent, so it works equally well on Linux and, and Windows. Um, we often see it appended to images as well, so it makes the forensic investigator's job a lot harder. Um, you know, certainly when you're looking at this traffic on the wire and you're seeing images, you're not always looking out for uh, sort of web shell traffic appended to, uh, to the images. So basically, this is how um, yeah, Chopper works. You, you have a small eval statement inserted into a web page. So for ASP, simple line at the top, it's taking um, a variable from a request, a post request called ABC, and it's passing that to eval. So the ASP interpreter is going to evaluate the string that's passed to it from the post request uh, as ASP. Um, similar thing with ASPX, uh, for this particular version, it's actually inserting JavaScript, um, and that's what's going to be evaluated client-side. And similar thing with PHP, also has an eval uh, function, grabs the ABC post request variable and supplies it yeah, straight to the PHP interpreter. So what this means is that the threat actor can now transmit ASP, ASPX, PHP code directly to the client and have it executed. So what can we do with that? Uh, I managed to get my hands on a tool that the Threat Act has been using. Um, don't know how clearly you can see that, but basically you can configure this to point to um, any web server. You configure the page. You configure the post variable, ABC, as we've got in the top there. You can select a list of um, yeah, different languages you want to target, ASP, ASPX, PHP, et cetera. And once you're configured, you right click and you've got a shell. So in this example, I've just run a simple netstack command. We can see the connection you know, back to myself and run a who am I command. And we can see that we're running within the default IIS user account. After that, this particular tool has a file browser baked into it. So we can actually browse yeah, all the files on the file system. We can upload files. We can download files. We can modify the timestamp, copy files around on the system, and all of this remotely. So uh, yeah, it's a very powerful tool. 
we can also execute script directly, so this tool makes it very easy for the threat actor to uh, develop their own ASP code, to copy and paste it into this uh, application, and run it client-side. Uh, also has reasonable support for, uh, for database connection strings, so we can connect to MS SQL database, and we can start playing with XP command shells, all sorts of things. We can query data, pull it back. Um, yeah, completely own a database from here. As for how that looks on the wire, um, don't know how clearly you can see that at the back, but basically the, the main uh, post request contains encoded scripts. So the, the threat actors tried reasonably hard in this instance to obfuscate the code. Um, so yeah, at least in this example, because it's running over HTTP, you've got clear visibility of, of what's happening. Uh, with HTTPS, obviously, you don't get that. Um, it's not too tricky to develop uh, snort rules to detect this um, at, at the HTTP level. But I have seen some newer variants recently that really, yeah, they mix things up, they encode things differently, they encode payloads differently each time. Uh, so it, it's quite hard to, uh, to gain detection on this. So yeah, I mean, basically I've everything, everything I've just talked about. It's, it's pretty versatile. It's used a lot. It's used a lot to drop um, you know, reverse SOX proxies, for instance, and then pivot further into the network. Um, yeah, I've seen this running perfectly on Linux, the same as Windows. Um, and yeah, I mean, AV products are not detecting this very well at all. As we saw from the, the eval statements that are inserted into the, uh, the HTML on the, the client side, there's not a lot to go on. And most AV engines aren't really uh, scanning things that closely. I'd certainly recommend if anybody's dealing with compromise assessments, uh, or sort of worried that their web server's been popped, definitely go and have a scan for eval statements. You really probably shouldn't see them in production code. So anything you do find, definitely uh, investigate thoroughly. Second web shell I came across uh, sort of middle of last year uh, it was an Outlook web access Trojan. Uh, very interesting in that it had replaced the logon DLL that Outlook itself uses. <laughs> Uh, to authenticate users via the, uh, the web logon. So what it was able to do was actually grab your usernames and passwords as users were logging in. Uh, it would encrypt them, it would write them to disk, and store them away. So the threat actor could come along later on, download that file, and hey, they've got domain cred uh, credentials. Uh, it had also baked a C2 protocol in there as well, so it was able to perform basic file handling. Uh, you could upload files, you could execute them, modify timestamps, etc., cetera. Um, and also some fairly comprehensive uh, database handling as well. So you could query databases, um, pull back tables, things like that. So just a very quick look at that one in action. Um, here is the application and request function where basically it's stripping the username and password straight out of the request. Uh, it's encoding it using, I think this one was using DES, and writing it out to disk to c colon backslash log.txt. Um, so we're actually able to, to grab that file, to decrypt it using the, the key that was supplied there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And at least then we were able to give the client a, sort of a better idea of what credentials have been compromised. And yeah, just to, for completeness, really, um, as part of the error handling for the page, it was then able to strip out additional request uh, variables that you wouldn't perhaps normally see when logging in via Outlook Web Access. And this is what it was using to perform the, um, the C2, so command and control. Um, via that, you could specify, you know, upload a file, and then the contents of the file, and it would write that out to a, a location on disk. Um, very effective credential stealer. Um, very hard to spot as well. Again, no AV had coverage of that at the time, and it took quite a bit of effort to actually dig down and locate where that DLL, DLL resided. Um, and I'm expecting to see quite a bit more of this over the next year or so. Um, you know, basically more um, DLLs, web pages, whatever, mimicking legitimate services such as email logons, VPN logons to steal credentials. 
Um, so yeah, generally web shells are, are pretty surreptitious in nature. Um, very easy to deploy and operate in a lot of instances, as we saw with Chopper just a moment ago. When you have the server-side component, you drop an eval statement in a web page and you're good to go. The GUI does all the heavy lifting for you. And yeah, if you, you fancy visiting that URL there, there is an excellent collection of web shells for just about every conceivable language. Um, yeah, I recommend grabbing those if you're, if you're a pen tester. <laughs> Okay, moving on to remote access Trojan command and control. Uh, we've seen some very novel approaches in remote access Trojan C2 over the last year. Um, I think we're still playing the cat and mouse game quite a bit with the threat actors, so the more we uncover, the more we block their techniques, the more they, they shift them around and, and try out new things. So I'm sure a lot of you are aware of DNS tunneling. We'll have a quick look at that. Um, we've seen Google Translate used, we've seen Google Code used, GitHub, various paste bin type services you know, where you can literally just paste a, a chunk of text online and have it hosted. We've seen a, a lot of threat actors abusing that to fire off commands to various bits of malware they've installed within the environment. And the same with blogs and message boards, forums, sort of anywhere really where you can openly post messages, threat actors are abusing this. Um, they're also doing a lot as well to throttle uh, network traffic. So you know, if you consider things from an incident responder's perspective, we might be looking for uh, malicious traffic in, say, Google Translate. It's very hard to spot again, client side. Uh, some of the big giveaways we have seen is a high volume of connections originating from uh, specific bits of malware. But now they're really they're tuning that, they're throttling it back. Um, they're making sure that perhaps it only makes one request an hour. And from an incident responder's perspective, that looks normal. And it can be quite hard to, to differentiate the, the good from the bad. So let's have a look, quick look at DNS tunneling. Uh, typically sends encoded, encoded data via uh, DNS text records. It's a lot more prevalent in malware recently. And yes, it's very hard to detect and block. So typical example for this, a threat actor will register the authoritative name server for, in this example, evil.com. Um, a remote access Trojan will attempt to look up the text record for that. And it will typically take some data from the system. Maybe it's exfiltrating data. Maybe this is just asking for the next command, whatever. It will encrypt that, compress that. Or I should say compress, then encrypt. Uh, it will then encode it using some method. We've seen you know, standard uh, base 16 encoding. We've seen base 64. We've seen transposed alphabets, pretty much everything you can imagine before prepending that to the domain name and firing off the DNS request. So at that point, uh, when it hits the, the local or public DNS resolver, the, the resolver's not going to be aware of the domain, and it's going to forward that on to the attacker's uh, authoritative name server. Um, what that means is, in certain environments, if you're talking with, say, public Google DNS servers, uh, you won't actually see any connections from a compromised endpoint to um, threat actors' infrastructure. It will be essentially proxied via Google's DNS servers or by your own internal DNS servers. And similarly, then, the, once the name servers receive this request, it can decode it, decrypt it, act upon it, and then send a response back encoded in the text record. So that could be, you know, standard CMD commands. Um, it could be, yeah, the contents of a file that it wants to be written to the file system and then executed. Pretty much anything. It, it really depends on the protocol. Um, so yeah, it, it's been a pretty effective way of performing co command and control. Um, we've largely got on top of it in many cases. Um, yeah, it still remains a quite a problem in that lots of legitimate products use this technique. So you'd think it would be very easy sitting at the network level to uh, produce some snort rules to detect this, to uh, you know, uh, grep for logs, perform some regex searches, um, maybe detect long domains, for example. 
Um, but we've seen, let me name a few, Skype would be one of them. I've seen several security vendors, ESET being one of them, who are actually using DNS tunneling for legitimate purposes, um, yeah, for various means. And it, it kind of overwhelms you with a lot of data to look at as, a, as an analyst. So really, if you can, it's best to limit DNS to known infrastructure within your organization. It's one of the most effective ways to stomp this one out. And of course, if you're a pen tester, DNS cat, a uh, very useful tool for, for providing DNS tunneling services. A quick glance at Google Translate then. So this is abusing the translation process. Uh, Google Translate, you know, typically you, you'd feed it a string in whatever language and it will translate it back to your preferred language. You can also pass it a URL and it will translate a web page for you. So what if, rather than you know, translating a perfectly legitimate page, you took some data from the system, you compress it, you encrypt it, you encode it, and then you append that to the URL uh, of a page you'd like to translate. Well, basically a bit of malware we uncovered did this. So here's the API call that we, we stripped out of this malware. And as you can see, it's using Google Translate. I've redacted the domain for this one. Uh, but there's a long string of encoded data appended to that. So Google Translate will, will take this request and essentially it proxies it. So that's going to be sent straight off to the threat actor's web server. They can then pick up this encoded string, perform whatever actions they want on it, and then send a response back in the web page. Um, again, it's all to limit the exposure to sort of TA infrastructure. Uh, you're not really going to spot any outgoing connections to, to any malicious IPs. And frequency uh, limited, yeah, it's pretty hard to spot. Um, so it is susceptible to some traffic analysis, and there are some magic boxes out there that will decrypt HTTPS traffic. Probably stands, uh, stands you in good stead in this front. But um, yeah, certificate pinning as well is also a problem. So we've seen some malware that's attempting to do that as well. So if you're dropping new certs onto the system so a, a content inspection system can work, the malware's not going to accept it. In fact, it will, in some cases, I've seen them still manage to talk out directly without breaking the SSL handshake. Uh, yeah, GitHub was another one we saw. Now, this wasn't really bi-directional communication. So What's happening here is that the attacker will issue commands via posts or commits, basically, to files stored within the GitHub repository. Um, coupled often with various C2 mechanisms, so it's usually issued to, yeah, usually um, just provides a straight command to the malware, something to act upon. And definitely look out for requests to raw.github user content. So this example that I have here, I have to redact this quite heavily as this file is still online and still accessible, but this was from an active investigation. Um, so the, the top line, it's basically targeting all systems which have this URL installed. And the out URL command basically is telling the malware to phone home. So the malware is going to perform a post to the URL listed at the top there. And I know it's been chopped up quite a bit. And it will provide some basic details like the host name, the user account, um, so on and so forth. A couple of the additional commands further down, uh, down exec, are actually instructing the malware to download and execute a file that's also stored on GitHub. So again, minimizing exposure to uh, threat actor infrastructure you will only ever see connections to, to GitHub in this instance. One of the wonderful things with this is that we get to see the history of commands. Um, certainly if we're a bit late joining the game and investigating things, we can at least with GitHub go back, look at the revision history, and see what commands the, the threat actor posted up to the server and, and got the client to run. So it can be very helpful in, in investigations. Again, HTTPS, big problem. Um, yeah, frequency limiting is a big problem. And we're seeing more and more of this, um, certainly as things progress. So yeah, increasingly, 
it's using known good infrastructure simply to limit the exposure to attacker infrastructure. They really don't want you to know where they're coming from. Um, combined with throttling mechanisms, making it very hard to spot. Uh, we're often unaware now of C2 traffic until we've discovered the malware on endpoints, we've reversed them, and we've looked at what domains they're talking to. So, yeah, pretty hard to spot. I definitely, from a, a pen testing point of view, would encourage more use of open services like this. You know, it, it really uh, limits your exposure. Okay, moving on completely, uh, PlugX. Very interesting remote access Trojan. Um, utilizes DLL side loading to, to load up a payload. I think that was well covered at, at Crescon last year. Um, it has a modular C2 layer, so it's very easy to configure it to use different communication channels. Uh, and also comes with a, a very nice yeah, sort of builder tool where you can configure the malware, you can package it up any way you like um, prior to shipping it out. So it usually arrives as a, a raw self-extractor. Now, one of the interesting trends we've, we've seen with PlugX is that the threat actor will try and tailor the, the side loading technique to match security products installed within the environment. So, for instance, if customer X is running um, Symantec, the threat actor will actually go find an executable um, from Symantec that's susceptible to DLL side loading vulnerabilities. They will use that, package um, the PlugX payload with it, and then ship it out to the client, purely so it doesn't trigger alerts within the environment. So if an analyst comes along and looks at it, they will see a signed legitimate Symantec executable, and hey, that was meant to be there, right? Um, so they're, they're really going to great efforts to try and blend in with the environment. The C2 layer, yeah, fully modular, uh, supports most of the, the C2 protocols I just spoke about. Um, so very easy to set up for HTTP, HTTPS, um, DNS tunneling, not a problem. FTP, absolutely fine, as is SL, uh, SSL and Google Translate. Um, I have a quick look at the builder. I'm sorry I didn't manage to translate any of the strings. Um, basically, off the main tab, you can configure um, service names. So it, we dropped and run as a service on the system. Um, here you can configure yeah, HTTP connections. You can configure, yeah, what else have we got? DNS and SSL in there. Uh, we can configure which DNS servers this malware is going to talk back to. Um, so if you wanted to use the local DNS resolver residing within the network, you just blank that box out. If you want to talk to Google, 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 .8, um, and you're probably not going to see the, any DNS traffic within the network. This is probably the most interesting page of them all. It looks like a complete mess. Um, Across the top, we've got 0 to 23. Down the side, we've got Monday to Sunday. What this enables the, the builder of the malware to do is configure what times of the day they want to be able to um, phone home. So this is how they're limiting uh, C2 communications. You could say only talk back between 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. You could be even more specific. You could say the only window you have to phone home is you know, midnight uh, for 15 minutes on a Monday. So, yeah, this has really made it much easier for threat actors to yeah, to rate limit, uh, throttle the communications, and yeah, made it a lot harder for us to spot. We were heavily relying on um, yeah, histograms and, and frequency analysis. And I don't have a, an awful, awfully good overview of what that tab's doing. <laughs> so it's a highly configurable and, and feature-rich Trojan. Um, pretty easy to get your hands on as well. I wouldn't trust it if you were thinking about using it, um, but certainly a, a good inspiration for further tools. Very easy to, to blend in with the environment that usually comes bundled with a good collection of um, vulnerable executables from security vendors, from companies like Google and ESET and Trend. 
uh, that you can use out of the box uh, with DLL side loading techniques. And for some reason, again, AV detection is, is not great. Um, they use quite a range of, of packers and protect, uh, protectors and various obfuscation techniques. And I think everything combined together, it, it's throwing the AV guys off quite a bit. Okay, sticky keys, just when you thought you'd seen it all. Um, this one resurfaces again. So you, we found this in, 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 uh, in an investigation recently. It tries to mimic the original sticky keys on the system uh, and has very nifty functionality in that it uses cheat codes to mask its functionality. So I'm not sure how clear that is at the back. This was the initial alert we were presented with some months ago. And what really stood out here was that sethc.exe had somehow spawned a cmd.exe that was used to run the who am I command. That looks pretty wrong. Um, so we managed to get the, the binary associated with this uh, attack, and we started pulling it apart. We threw it at dynamic analysis systems, and we weren't seeing an awful lot. So started analyzing it a bit more closely, and now here's what a legitimate sticky keys dialog should look like. And here's the malicious version. So I'll just go back and forwards a bit there. They're pretty similar. We're, we're missing the ease of access center link. And for those who can't really read it at the back, we've got some, yeah, we've got a pretty bad spelling mistake in there. Uh, the keyboard shortcut two, spelt T-U, turn on sticky keys. Um, so pulling it apart a little bit, we threw this one in the disassembler, had a good look around, uh, managed to locate the, the portion of code responsible for spawning cmd.exe and working back from there we found some interesting get key state function calls. Now, yeah, this is not usual behavior at all. We'd not expect to really see this. And we fired up the, the application again. We started feeding in the key states it was responding to. And the first one, control Y CMD, mashing that on the keyboard, popped up a command prompt uh, running under the system account. So. You know, what the, the threat actor was really trying to do here, again, was blend in with the environment to present a legitimate looking application to the user. And only when you start mashing the keyboard with this, this key combo uh, would this window appear. I say mashing the keyboard, there were some bugs in the code. So it wouldn't respond to a straight control Y CMD request. You had to keep hitting it quite a bit. <laughs> there was also a second key combination. Um, Control-O-S, and we press that, and where the ease of access center link should be, we got a new box pop up and a, a button that I won't read out loud in Crescom. <laughs> Enter in an application path into the text box, hit that button, and yeah, you can basically launch any application you like. Now this is running at the logon prompt here. Um, sorry, the screenshot's not so good. So. The threat actor is not logged into the system here. They just needed RDP access. Uh, in this instance, they got it through a web shell and a reverse SOX proxy. They were able to uh, get to a system that had this installed. And without ever logging on, they could use this to run any application they wanted. So pretty powerful. Um, definitely a very novel concept. I've been working with malware for a very long time. And I think that's the first time I've really seen cheat codes used that effectively. Definitely let down a bit by the, the spelling mistakes. They'd gone to a lot of effort to try and replicate the application, but I think they'd very much overlooked the fact that, yeah, the spelling mistakes, the, the lack of the link, uh, just little touches like that gave the game away. Um, can't be analyzed really in a VM. Uh, no automated VM is gonna supply that key combination. That code path will not be executed. Um, and yeah, I say hard to detect, could be made harder uh, if it was packed a bit better, obfuscated, um, perhaps using some ciphers around the uh, key combinations. I think the, the threat actors could take this one quite a bit further. WMI, yeah, it's probably been, been quite widely covered. 
Um, this one was a new one to us though. We uh, basically uncovered a new persistence mechanism. So to give you a, a brief overview, WMI is used a lot by threat actors for querying information on systems, for moving laterally. I'm sure you guys are quite well aware of it. Um, quite common with pass the hash style attacks, so it's easy to authenticate against other systems. And recently we've been seeing this used for persistence. This might not be so clear again. Um, basically this is an overview of WMI events that are registered on a server. Now it's possible to register um, WMI events that will respond to well, actually quite a wide range of events that the operating system will fire. Now, in this instance, the script has been supplied directly. So the, there's no script file residing on disk. Um, if you can see the script text, uh, which is the, the fairly long screen that's been somewhat redacted there, that contains a, uh, well, a web shell, basically. Um, but the script itself, it's not stored on disk, it's not stored in the registry, it's stored in the WMI database along with all the other WMI information. So there's actually nothing on disk for AV products to scan. Um, if you're performing a forensic analysis of a compromised machine, you will not see that script anywhere on the file system. Um, pretty tricky to, to spot. The script itself that was bundled with this malware um, was quite interesting as well. I can't include all of it here. Basically what it was doing, the, the get command function was firing off an HTTP get request. That get request would return a VB script, so very much like the web shells uh, we saw earlier. And then it's using execute global, so this essentially it's like an eval statement in other languages. So if you supply uh, a string containing VB script to execute global, it will run it. And that's what was happening here. It then grabs any output that that script generated and posts it back to the web server. So that goes straight back to the, the threat actor. So yeah, it's, it's a very powerful um, fileless persistence mechanism. You can trigger that to, to fire on a whole range of events. You could leave it inactive for a long period of time. We've seen threat actors do that as well. You know, respond to very obscure events that uh, you know, won't be triggered very often. Um, the only real sign that anything is executed is that the WMI standard event consumer, which is scrcons.exe, will have run on the system. Now, if you're not using WMI events usually in your environment, that executable will not be run. So from a sort of forensic investigations perspective, if you see that executed, if you see that in a timeline, uh, it's definitely a good idea to go and look further, check out the events on the system, query the WMI database, and uh, see if anything's amiss. Um, Dropbox. Um, we're seeing this used quite a bit by uh, threat actors as well. Again, it's masking their infrastructure, it's using publicly available services. Um, they're typically using PowerShell to interact, although yeah, any, any scripting language will do. And it's being used to download malware and exfiltrate data. So here's an example of a script we found on one system. Um, simple PowerShell script, it adds the Dropbox bearer token um, to, the, to an HTTP authorization header and then calls download file and is pulling down a sample called malware.exe, saving it in ctemp and executing it. Uh, conversely, we've also seen exfiltration of data and you know, large, large amounts of data being exfiltrated through Dropbox. Um, Similar thing, sets the bearer token in the HTTP headers and then calls upload file. Uh, that is basically performing a put. It's grabbing a file this time in C Windows temp called secrets.txt and it puts it straight onto the threat actor's Dropbox account. 
Um, the interesting thing here is that you know, this can be run on multiple hosts. They can all be uploading to secrets.txt and via Dropbox, you can then go and look at all the various revision histories. You can see which hosts have, have uploaded the file. Uh, it's a, a pretty powerful way, again, of sneaking data out of the environment. One interesting thing, and I'll, I'll go back to the slide, there is the, the bearer token. I'm not saying you should do this. I'm not saying anyone has done this. But once you're in possession of the bearer token, it is technically possible to then go and utilize the Dropbox API to query information about the account. Um, in fact, you can get account information. You can see who created the account, email addresses. I've tested with a, a private account. Um, you can also see the contents of all the files. You can quite easily put a script together to download every file that's been posted to, to that Dropbox account and all revisions. Um, so yes, I'm not saying anyone should do it. It's probably very illegal, certainly very illegal, but um, definitely an, an interesting angle to, to look at things. Um, yeah, and again, pretty hard to, to spot at the network level and on endpoints as well. Um, all talking to legitimate infrastructure. Yeah, just not going to see it. And very sorry, I seem to have blazed through things incredibly quickly, as seems to have been the trend. And <laughs> thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> very sorry for finishing early. Not at all. <laughs> I think we've got some questions for Tom. There's a question here in the front. Great. Adriana? So, obviously, once you discover that, So once you've discovered those things, how are you stopping that coming back into the network? Very good question. Generally, by remediating, um, we can you know, sometimes, it depends on the client, it depends on the setup. We can block access to certain services whilst we're, we're remediating. Um, you know, we can then, once we're aware of some of these techniques, it's a lot easier to then Go and scan the network, see who has been talking to, you know, say, GitHub. Was that coming off of a domain controller or a file server? Hmm, that doesn't seem quite right. We can go and dig a bit more closely. But yeah, it, it can be a real challenge. And, and quite often, you know, we might have to block traffic for a little bit whilst we're uh, investigating and getting to the bottom of this. Any more questions? Oh, there must be more. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on attribution, particularly the sticky keys one? I have lots of thoughts on attribution. I know exactly who wrote that, where it came from, but um, don't really want to, to speak too much on that front right now. Uh, if you're seeing similar things, happy to chat on it. Um, but yeah, don't really want to give the game away too much and don't want to point any fingers. Yeah. We're seeing it with everybody, um, and it, it varies wildly too. So even PlugX changes a lot between variants, um, even when used by the same threat actors. And actually, one of the, the big trends we've seen recently is that even once a TA has established a foothold within an environment, they won't then generate one version of PlugX and distribute it to all hosts. They're quite happy to, to sit back at base and generate you know, 100 different copies, send them out to different machines, all using different encoding mechanisms, different C2 protocols, different addresses. It really makes our life a lot harder. Um, and yeah, of course, different obfuscation routines with each. Question right up the back there. Might need a microphone, Adriana. <laughs> Ooh, good question. Um, I mean, it, it's a range of techniques from, you know, compromised systems, vulnerable systems, to um, probably one of the big ones still today that's working, that's reliable, that will get you in just about every time is phishing. And spear phishing works. 
And you know, quite incredibly, we're really seeing um, yeah, sort of the rise of the macro again. I remember macros being an issue back in about 2000, and to see that that's still a problem today, and it was still one of the most prominent um, sort of malware delivery mechanisms over the last year is absolutely astounding. Uh, yeah, can't believe it. <laughs> Fantastic. So, awesome. uh, thank well, thanks so a lot. Tom. I'm very sorry uh, for finishing earlier. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs>Thank you very much, Tom. Now, um, Ian Glover is going to join us, as I'm sure you know, the president of Crest. He's going to come along and give a keynote in a, a couple of moments. Um, just in the meantime, just another reminder, everybody, if you haven't had your stamped, your card, your card stamped, then please go and get it done because the prize draws at uh, 10 past five shortly after Ian's finished. Um, and also the winner of the silent auction for the books will be announced at 10 past five in the main hall as well. So that would be really worth hanging around for. Um, just a reminder, thank you very much to all of our sponsors. We couldn't do this without you. Really appreciate that. But um, I'm going to stand down for a moment. We'll wait for Ian to come along in just a couple of moments. Thank you very much. I think, I think we've, uh, Ian Glover's stuck in a, in a panel in one of the other streams. So um, I've been asked to do a quick wrap up. So I, I don't know what Ian generally says. I think he is, thank you for everybody for coming to, to CrestCon. Um, we do seem to go from strength to strength every year. And I think we've had over 400 or so people this year and against sort of 300 or so last year. So that's, that's excellent. It's the first time we've run three streams. So uh, as you can see by the fact that I'm here now, uh, sometimes the timings creak. Um, uh, from a Crest point of view over the next couple of years, we're looking to grow the organization substantially. Uh, there'll be a lot of comms coming out to members and other, other people uh, over the next year or so. You're all aware that we are trying to, to globalize because it's, it's very much our aim to have one globally recognized standard uh, for pen testing. Because as, as, as you're all aware and as the, the last uh, talk showed and a lot of the talks today, you know this, this is a global problem. The threat actors use common methodologies. They don't care which territory they come from. So uh, our clients want to make sure they get a consistent level of assurance um, globally. So uh, I won't sort of uh, stand between you and drinks uh, too much longer. Uh, once again, thank you to our sponsors. Um, if anyone did lose that Oyster card that I mentioned this morning, go and grab it so you can go home. Or alternatively, uh, take advantage of uh, a very sign who are very kindly paying for the, the drinks in the main auditorium this evening. I'm not going to kill quite enough time to get in in here, so uh, I will wrap up now. Thank you for attending and very much hope to see you all next year. Thank you.